Located in the heart of Dublin's north inner city, One Place has provided acute paediatric care for almost 140 years. A home from home which offers safety at times of uncertainty. This building tells a story of hope, determination and strength. And tonight we go behind its doors share the stories from the theatres and wards, to meet the staff who dedicate their lives to the care of Ireland's children, and to follow the journey of families and their little patients who are in need of vital and life-saving treatment. Welcome to Temple Street Children's Hospital. Temple Street. Upstairs in St. Gabriel's, Owen has arrived with his parents ahead of surgery. He said to get a tumour removed from his brain again. He had his first tumour when he was one and it's after growing back so we're here to get it removed again tomorrow. It just happened to get grown back there again at Christmas. The doctor had never guaranteed us that would never come back like but we were kind of fingers crossed that wouldn't come back and just happened it has come back now. He was very, very sick and he had a very large brain tumour and he had secondary build-up of fluid in the brain. Following an initial tumour removal, today Owen is back at Temple Street for a second time. Now, we always knew that there was a small bit of that tumour left behind. They've been watching that with, with scans over the last few years. When we were told that it had grown back, at first it was a bit of a shock, but we knew there was always that consideration that it might happen again. We were told that uh, they were going to really keep an eye on it and just watch how fast it was growing. Over the last two or three years, the residual tumour in the brain has got you know, larger on successive scans, so that's why we came to a decision a couple of months ago that he would need surgery. Now, the problem is we don't know whether um, the surgery is going to affect his speech again and his balance. There's balance doesn't be too bad until it starts to grow again. And then we notice the balance beginning to go and then everything starts up again. After the surgery, uh, he lost everything. He knew us, but he couldn't uh, say our names or anything like that to us. Well, the worst part is the operation because it can take so long and it your help, there's nothing you can do. Walking around, hoping and waiting to say that everything's okay. Over in the day ward, Adam has arrived with his mum. Adam's here today for his tonsillectomy because he's had lots of episodes of tonsillitis. So we're going to sort it all out, just like when his daddy was a little boy, they did it too. <laughs> Lots of throat infections and missing school. So he's in, he was in senior infants and he, he lost a few weeks of school. Different, every couple of weeks he'd have sore throat and temperature and feeling sick. We're just going to the GP, we got a referral letter and then we came in to see Dr Rowley probably two or three months ago while he was in still, still in school. And she took one look and said, yeah, they could do it coming out and they'd sort out all those problems he has. So uh, we scheduled him for July so that he wasn't going to miss two weeks of school. So here we are. Just one second, I'll just check this mum. You don't have to bring your bag, you're going to keep that here. See, this press is yours. So that will be waiting for you when you come back down. Adam has had a problem of um, recurrent sore throats and recurrent tonsillitis and he actually gets quite sick with them. He gets a sore throat, he stops eating, uh, loses energy. Uh, Mum says that he even gets vomiting associated. Now that's a little bit unusual but, but can happen. He's quite noisy when he sleeps as well so he snores a little bit uh, and that can be because of the tonsils but it can also be because the adenoids are big in children generally of Adam's age. 
and we tend to take, scoop the adenoids out with the tonsils if they need to come out at the same time. Okay. Why don't you need to put on one of these? Oh, just to keep her nice and clean. <laughs> Adam had a lot of questions. I wanted to know all about um, the process of coming into hospital and, and what would be involved. I wanted to know all about coming up to theatre. Are <laughs> you going to do the operation? No. <laughs> I usually go out and I met Adam and tell him that I'm wearing a funny hat because sometimes they don't recognise me in the theatre gear. Oh, but this one is to make you better. He missed some school. Um, yeah. He missed some swimming. He's a very good swimmer, aren't you? Yeah, I yeah. missed some swimming. <laughs> <laughs> I was just tucking it in the You're going to take it the microphone? Wait, Rachel has a microphone, so if I take it off, so you will be able to hear me. Being like in hospital is a great thing. Meanwhile, in the neurology department, Laura is waiting for a consultation. Oh, thanks. Um, when I started the day she was born, we ended up bringing her back into the rotunda and um, she was having seizures and they'd done a few tests and things like that. Tried to find out what it was. We came across at the time she was Dr. King and she was running some tests to try to find out what the reason that was causing her to have the seizures. She was home within 24 hours and she just kept jerking and I thought she was cold so I wrapped her in a blanket and it stopped so that's all I thought it was but it happened again and again and then when she started frotting at the mouth then we knew then that there was something. Oh thank you. Oh thank you. Oh, thank you. Love to kiss us. So day after day there was more and more tests run and um, after about a week she was sent for an MRI and a CT scan and um, Dr King came up with the diagnosis called hemimegalencephaly. Yeah which basically means half a large brain. Well, it, was, it was malfunctioning, which was what was causing all the seizures. You can see how large it is to the extent that it's actually almost traveled to the other side and pushed the normal side. The major test to diagnose seizures is an EEG. And that's a test where we put electrodes on the patient's head and we measure the electric activity of the brain. And we're able to detect excessive electric activity and seizure activity and also localize where it's coming from. So she would have had several of those. So there's one to diagnose and there's several to follow up. You can see how hazy and thick it is. So for the first almost two years of her life, there was constant seizures. And with the hemimegalencephaly, they basically run out of the medication because it can only work for a certain length of time because the seizures is end of it is so complex and so difficult to control. Oh, when I think back, I don't even know how we manage. She has a bigger sister who was only almost two when she was born. So we're trying to deal with her as well, but they're not knowing. And then even when the word hemimegalencephaly, I couldn't even pronounce it for, never mind even spell it, it was hard. They're not knowing of what was wrong with her child or like we were told she may never walk and she may never talk. And we were told that if she wasn't a candidate for surgery, because not everybody with hemimegalencephaly is a candidate for surgery, um, if she wasn't a candidate for surgery, she would be possibly dead before she's two, because the seizures would get her in the end and you'd probably run out of medication to control them. And then Dr. King brought us in um, to a little room, parents' room, just off the intensive care unit in the rotunda, and sat us down and said the hemimegalencephaly was a condition that has pretty much uncontrollable seizures and we didn't know what to say, didn't know what to do. And she said that um, if it was, a, um, you know, if she may end up getting surgery and if it was a case that she was a candidate for surgery, she would need half her brain removed. And that's what happened to her. She had the left-hand side of her brain removed. The next morning, Owen is prepared for theater. They're hoping to get him down for eight, wasn't it, they were saying. So, with a bit of luck, the doctor won't be too far away. He was down yesterday, he explained everything, went through what could happen and what. But he hopes to get out of it, like... But, as I said yesterday, I don't think it will be fully cut out. It'll just be constantly ongoing. They'll watch him every six months, like the way they did with the MRIs and then. If the growth comes back again, then it's just back in here again or back into a different hospital. 
he's used to coming in, getting his MRIs and getting back out the same day, so when he sleeps in, he knows there's something going on. It was felt better to address this now rather than, rather than waiting for him to get sick. Because if we'd left it, it would have got bigger and bigger and bigger. He's just there for a second. Okay. In general, if you're having surgery in the brain, the better you are going in to have it done, the better you are when you come out. So this is Owen Purcell? Owen Purcell. So he's been in and out over the last couple of months. He's had some extra scans to prepare him for the surgery. Owen's parents have been down this road before with Owen because he's had his previous surgery as a baby. So I think they need an awful lot of support having to go through this very tough time again. We need to establish a good relationship with them so we can all work together looking after Owen post-operatively. And we need to be able to ensure that they understand what is going on. Uh, right, say goodbye, Mum. See you later. Get the kids. It's very hard, you know, because when he was only one, it would have been the bottom would have fallen out of their world. You know, your child has a brain tumour uh, and he's going in for major, major surgery. It's impossible to imagine what's going through parents' heads, you know, when, when they're given that. No one wants to see their child going through this kind of surgery twice. Even though they knew that the tumour was going to come back, uh, or likely to come back, I suppose when it came down to the crunch decision, they were going to go ahead and have surgery. Would have brought back all those memories from years ago. He's prepared for surgery in, in that he's had special scans done here that we can load onto what we call an image guidance computer. So that allows me to know exactly where my instruments are and where I am in relation to the scan that he's had beforehand. He's given a dose of steroids which protect the brain against swelling. He's given a dose of antibiotics to try and prevent infection. He's put lying on his tummy because the tumour is around the back of the brain. He's put in special pins uh, and he decided to hold the head very still, not just so that he doesn't move during surgery, but also uh, to hold his head steady for that image guidance or that sat-nav type equipment that we're using. He's had a scar there already from when he was one, so he went through the same scar to, to, to get at, at, at the tumour. The tumour is deep within the brain, uh, very near what we call the brain stem. We have to try and get through to the tumour without causing any injury to the surrounding brain, and in particular not to the brain stem because that's the part of the brain that keeps you alive. The potential pitfalls or risks with this kind of surgery is a risk to your life. Are you going to go down and get a cup of tea? Or? Breakfast. Yeah. You know you have to be strong for him, like... Mm. Doesn't get any easier. No. <laughs> mm. Mind you, it's, it's usually it's not that bad when the MRI, it's just knowing that it's a big operation today is kind of dwarfed compared to it. I didn't get much sleep last night. Every time I seemed to fall asleep, I just woke up again, so I was just tossing and torn. It's just nerves. The yeah, anxious to get the operation done. Probably get through it. Then we start all over again. See how it affects them. This is the worst part. Mm. As bad as it was getting in for the operation now, it's just sitting around waiting. You're helpless. Nothing you can do about it. You can try and think of something else, but it always gets back to where, you, where he is and what would happen to him if he survives the operation, things like that. There is um, a life training operation could die down there today. But we knew that the last time as well. So it's something you do have to prepare yourself for as well. In neurology, the team are pleased with Laura's progress. And you just couldn't help her. Bar, just give her the medication. There was nothing you could do. So when we got the opportunity to get her tested for their surgery, 
I begged and I pleaded for her to give her that chance because of the, she didn't have a life before that. And I was damned if I was going to give in to those seizures. Okay, if she didn't make it through the operation, at least we gave her a fighting chance, but I was damned if I was going to let those um, seizures take her. We just, we were flabbergasted to think that anybody could even survive with half a brain. I knew that there was a chance that she may not have made it. But there was no way could I leave my child the way she was beforehand. How bad? If you've seen her before, and there was no way in the world would I have left her in the state that those seizures had her in beforehand. She was non-existent. She hadn't got a life. She was breathing, but that was all she was doing. She wasn't living. So um, I asked her out straight. I said, I'm willing to take that chance with her life. Maybe I don't have the right, but I'm her mother and I need to give her the opportunity, if it succeeds, to become, to get to her potential. It's supposed to be a joyful moment when the child arrives to the world and the last thing you want to see is a child who's not able to feed, not able to smile, not able to interact with you, not able to do anything. If Laura were told that she's not operable, or that she's going to have to live with this, that would have been a disaster. So since the operation seizure free? Yes. No problems whatsoever? We brought her in on the 17th of September, 2008, over to Beaumont Hospital. And she went to bed that night. And when she woke up the next morning, she wasn't allowed to eat. She was fasting. She wasn't allowed to eat. And we were allowed, myself and her daddy were allowed to carry her down to the operating theatre. They gowned me up because I, I brought her in. She had a seizure in my arms as they were giving her the general anaesthetic. And that was the last one. She's and you're handy, yes, you're handy. She's becoming a bit shy now, huh? Yes, she is. Because mm -hmm. Laura, I know you since you were tiny. It's amazing to see her. I mean, you wouldn't know, if not for the scar on her head, that she's had half of her brain removed. So she's made a remarkable recovery. She's three years seizure-free. She's two years off all her medication. She's going to mainstream school uh, very shortly. She's doing fantastically. So this is the best scenario possible after an operation of that nature. Now, go home. Like, she started laughing. She started babbling. We were told she would never walk and never talk. Now she's starting to learn. The, the left-hand side of the brain is the side of the brain that controls speech. And because that's, apart from the fact that it was a malfunction in the beginning, it's now gone. The right-hand side now has to try and learn. She's starting to say a few words now and she's walking by herself. So it was a result. But the, as the time went on, there's certain things that she could do, like little kind of milestones. Sitting up by herself. She could never sit up by herself. She was too weak to. She sat up by herself. And there was a little merry dance done around the house because that was so huge for her. She would have never been able to do it beforehand. Little things like that. Little milestones that people take for granted. <laughs> She's a lovable little girl. Over in theatre, Miss Rowley is completing surgery on Adam. I nearly always say to parents when they say, oh, the tonsils needed for anything, the tonsils and the adenoids are there to fight infection. They're one of the many parts of our body that fight infection. But to be honest, if they themselves are unhealthy, and particularly when they get infections, uh, then they're probably not doing their job very well. Certainly if it gets to a stage where a child is getting four or five episodes of tonsillitis a year, missing time off school, losing weight, bad energy, not able to run around and play as normal, sleeping poorly, um, then they're probably better off without them. We don't tend to take tonsils out as often nowadays as uh, years gone by, um, and that's because they do have a function, but certainly we still get many, many cases where children get significant infections, miss a lot of time off school, or in poor health because of um, the tonsil problem, and then once the tonsils are removed, they tend to thrive. Nowadays, it tends to be just an overnight stay. Uh, we tend to bring them in on the morning of surgery, uh, ideally, and then they have to stay one night in the hospital. The reason for that night, uh, stay overnight, is in case there's any complications that night. Yeah, you know he's going to be okay, but it's a bit, a bit emotional that way. And like they're trying to get him to look away, and he's looking at the needle, getting the Freddy, and you wanted to see it, didn't you? Yeah. You wouldn't look away. He's a bit like me, I would do that too. <laughs>
Doctor came along and she said he had huge tonsils. They were so big, we had to get rid of them. He's looking for toast, and as long as he's eating and does okay tonight, he'll be home tomorrow. And then just keep an eye on him for two weeks. Today we're the space bus. Um, tonsils are grown out now. <laughs> Meanwhile, Owen is transferred for a CT scan. He is likely to have some problems with his balance that are a little bit worse than it was before for a period of time after the surgery. And he's also likely to have a bit of a squint or problems with his gaze, but that would usually be temporary. Hopefully he would get back to where he was before we started. We'll have to cut through the, the brain, special instruments to get down onto the tumour, and then once we're on it, we tend to try and separate it off the surrounding brain, usually using a microsuction and bipolar, which is to burn little blood vessels that are, are going into the tumour. Once the tumour is removed, obviously we have to close the coverings of the brain and make sure that's all watertight and uh, close the skin. And then he's taken out of these special pins. Uh, we, we're going to keep him asleep and we're going to run him through the MRI scanner once more just to confirm. Obviously I'm going to try and remove all the tumour, but the MRI is, is there to confirm that it has all been removed. Okay, they come back up with the tube in for his breathing. We've just taken that tube out so we'll see how it goes. Just give us a couple of minutes, we just want to make up more for get himself. It's really long way, because you don't know what's happening. Mm. We survived the operation, so that's one part of our over. Oh, and fine, uh, no, no surprises. And uh, he's just had a scan now. Yeah, he scan, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he did one on the, on the way back. And it looks like it's all gone. So, they got go in very, very rare circumstances where you do have brainstem injury from surgery, you can have someone who can't breathe on their own at all. They, do, they would have to remain ventilated on a life support machine for you know, days or weeks. Uh, these things can and do happen. So he's be going to intensive care where we're be monitoring for those kind of things. Our first job is to maintain his airway when he arrives to us and he had an ET tube in situ for that. He was initially on the ventilator, but very briefly. He awoke, the ET tube was removed, and he was breathing on his own. Overnight, then, our main job is to make sure that the pressure inside his head does not increase. Maintain his own airway, and to let his level of consciousness return to normal, and he'll probably go to the ward tomorrow. Well, the biggest part is over now, like, the operation was the biggest part of it. That was the most part of it. As we knew, it was life-threatening the operation, so over that part of now just to see what damage has been caused to him for later on in the future. Maybe we'll work on that then. <laughs>